right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. This is the eighth Notary Governance Call of 2022, taking place on April 19th. This is the first session at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, my name is Kevin, and most of are going to walk through. So as far as the agenda is concerned, we have four big topic items, and we're going to dive into each of these as we go through. If this is your first time joining, we're going to start with warm introductions and give you a chance to sign up and say who you are, where you're from, if you want some more information on the program. We're going to briefly talk about the metrics, take a look at where the program is right now. Then we're going to talk about some of the community issues that you guys have flagged in Slack, and GitHub, and DMs, and make sure that everyone's aware of that. And then we're saving time for some discussion topics that were phrased uh, for what you'd like to flag and discuss as the community. So with that, just a quick hello. My name is Kevin. I um, help run the community engagement here at Filecoin Plus. Uh, Galen is on a well-deserved out-of-the-office vacation. And Deep is our magnificent member on the team right now, as you can see with his camera. And Deep leads the data flow clients and pretty much everything as we're working on it. If this is your first time on the call, feel free to come into chat, say hello. My name is uh, Wa. I submitted an application. I was curious what the process was or interested in becoming a notary, whatever it may be. Putting that in chat, we'll save that, reach out to you, give you a warm welcome as you come into it. If you are a notary and you're on the line, this is the link that we're going to follow to track attendance. It has a modification from last week. So I'm going to pop this. Actually, Deep, can I ask for your help? Can you drop that into chat for us right there? And when you go ahead and fill that out, you'll just put the date of this call, the session that you attended, your name, your organization, if it happens to be different, this makes it really easy to track, what your role is, your region, and the Slack and the Slack. This will give us a chance to kind of come through. Thanks for your help on me. So again, if you're on the call for the notary and you're for that participation, this would be the place to do it. All right. Let's take a quick look at metrics. We skipped over this last time because we had such a full agenda. Right now, what we're looking at is three big categories. And these are the categories that matter most to the community. The first is average time to data cap, which we have in this fill plus dashboard. If you've never seen this, we'll share the link later. And essentially, how long is it taking from the first time the request is made to data cap and how long it comes through? And so right now, we're two hours faster than we were at the last meeting. It's about a day, day and a half for that first data cap to snap in. The next one is first time to response. And so this is still sitting around that six day mark. And this is one of our big goals for 2022 is trying to get out of that and try to make that as fast as possible for how we make that with the community. And the last is the total amount of data cap allocated to clients. So right now we are sitting at 3.62, which is just massive in terms of scale on the network. So it really is Filecoin Plus that's driving this. You'll notice that there's two fields that are kind of blurred out. We're working on this right now. If you're curious to kind of follow this on a tactical basis for how we work on these dashboards and how we do this, a lot of this takes place in the public channel build dashboards that's in the Slack. So if you wanted to see and communicate, that would be the place that you go and we'll have those back up for you in the coming week. All right. Moving on to notary updates. So this is members of the community. This is members of notaries that may have questions. And these were some of the DMs that we got as well as the most common questions that have come across. So I wanted to take a couple of moments, flag these for everybody, that way everyone can learn from them. So the first question that we've gotten that came through is, hey, I saw that my application for a notary was approved. I had requested four petabytes, three petabytes, two petabytes, and I noticed that my application was knocked down to one petabyte. Here's the answer. So a few weeks ago, we submitted this request for proposal, and it was talking about how we can fairly distribute this data crap across all regions. And so in the last governance call, we discussed the pros and what would work out. And essentially, this way ensures that all applications have one standard baseline. So if you requested 50 terabytes, you still just got 50 terabytes. And this would only apply if you requested over that one petabyte level. It helps distribute that data cap across all regions. And if you did have a larger request that came through, that's where the LDM process comes in to have that additional level of that really large data that comes through. So if you were curious why your application was knocked to one, it's nothing to do with you. It's a way to fairly distribute that data across all regions as we go through. And this was discussed in the proposal that's linked, issue 490. 
So we're going to close that one out. And so just to reiterate, this was nothing to do with the applications or you, it's across the board. I'll kind of pause here if anybody has any questions on this and would like to ask. All right, I'll take that silence as no questions. If anything comes up, feel free to use the chat there at the bottom as we go forward. All right, the next question that came up was, hey, I'm a new notary. I'm curious what's happening with my application and what's going on with the steps in the onboarding process. So here's where we currently stand. We're bringing on a whole lot of new notaries this application. And with that comes a lot of just paperwork, for lack of a better saying, paperwork. So what I'm doing behind the scenes is I'm taking all of the GitHub issues that you filed, all of the application requests, and then referencing the application that you filled out that form in Airtable, where you acknowledged your region, where you acknowledged the rules of the program, where you acknowledged your time, where you listed your GitHub name, your email name, your Slack name. And what I've been doing behind the scenes is putting those in one common place to make sure that we're tracking those effectively. There's lots of Slack channels that need to be added, a lot of distribution lists that need to be created, and a lot of modifications on the back end to make sure that you can get in. It's just a very time consuming process. So everything is going according to plan. And if you've filled out your application in your GitHub issue, no changes are needed at this time. Some of you had asked a question about, hey, I wanted to make a change either to my email, to my Slack, or to my wallet. Totally fine. If you are going to make a change to your application, now is the time to do so, as long as it doesn't material change it. But if you have a new ledger address that you'd like to enter, just go into your GitHub repository, put that information in, and I'll be sure that that's what I'm drawing from as I pull it back. Once we have all of those applications processed, we have all of you kind of tracking, we'll make sure that you're in these three Slack channels and that's how we're gonna primary drive communication. So we have the private Slack channel for just members of the notaries. We have the fill plus application review. We'll talk about this on that call. And then we're gonna invite you to a private onboarding session. The way the onboarding will work is we are gonna have it in step-by-step -step guides as well as recorded Zoom sessions that you can watch at your leisure. It doesn't have to be live. And then we'll have dedicated questions that can be asked. So if you have specific questions, you can always bring that back later. The next is where can review requests be submitted or monitored? So we're seeing this question come up quite a bit in the public channels. So essentially what's happening is someone submits an application and they're curious what the status is after a few days. If you have any questions like this, whether you're a member of the client community, a storage provider, or a notary, the best place to phrase those questions is in the Fill Plus Application Review channel. It's another channel in Slack. It's totally public. And so what we're doing right now is that if any channel gets added or if someone posts a request for review in that main, I'll be removing it and then moving it to this channel. All of the notaries will be added to this channel once their ledger addresses are verified and everything's in place. And then what's nice is that this channel will say, hey, I'm looking for a notary in Asia GCM. Those notaries will then see it, and those will be the issues that we can then reply to. This isn't meant to be the first stop on the chain. So if you are submitting an application and you submit right there, there's no guarantee that the notaries are going to reprioritize it. They're going to be looking at GitHub as the source of truth. But if you have been waiting a few days, this will be the place to submit that request in that fill plus application review. And that's where that information can take place. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions on this Slack channel or in asking any questions with the onboarding process. Just one thing I wanted to add, um, you know, in accordance with our sort of push to continue making decisions and, and iterating uh, a little bit quicker and ensuring that applic like proposals and changes that are in like introduced actually get pushed through the system. Um, I'm going to move ahead and, and mark that one pebby byte upper bound as closed. Uh, as far as I know, got a little bit of support in the governance calls for it, Shot, saw some thumbs ups and stuff on GitHub, uh, nobody said anything, and we don't want to block the notary process. So unless anybody tells me otherwise right now, uh, you know, the PR is basically merged at this point. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close it out. And I like the, the fact that we're continuing to set precedents of 
moving a little bit quicker and actually closing the loop on these open issues. Um, I'd like to hope that those of you that have ideas also feel like you are enabled to make those changes. Um, and we're here to sort of support pushing those through as soon as we can as well. Let me know if you have any questions on that and, and general like governance cycle type stuff. We can actually spend some time talking about it at the end of the call, actually. That might be better. Great. Kevin is a wizard. Showed up with a new <laughs> new new background. Very nice. Moved outside. There's a little bit of background noise in that public space. Got it. All right. So kind of moving on with like these frequently asked questions. As the community increases, we kind of need to be a little bit more diligent in how we're establishing like good sanitation for our communication. So with that, getting an item on the agenda. So if you submitted an application and you'd like to give a presentation on who you are and why notary should look at you and allocate data requests, if you have any kind of topics as a notary that you'd like to flag for the community or have brought up for discussion, how do you do that? How do you get time on this call? So we can bake in your slides, allocate you time on the agenda and make sure that everyone is aware. The way to do that is in GitHub, after every notary governance call, I'll make a new issue. The issue looks like this that you see in the screenshot, I'll date it for what's gonna come up. And that is the place where you would make your request. So just make a comment on that issue. Hey, I like to present XYZ topic at the next notary governance meeting. Can I please get on the agenda? We're going to be a little bit strict on a couple of things. One is stating what your purpose is. What would you like to discuss? So if you are an application and you'd like to kind of bake in who you are, please give us the slides that you'd like to speak to just by hanging in the issue as well as what you're looking for. If you're a notary, same thing. Hey, I'd like to bring up this proposal for the community or this discussion and have your slide decks hung there. If you don't require any slide decks at all, feel free to say that in the comment. Hey, I just like to talk for five minutes about this issue. It's X, Y, Z. I don't need slides, but I need this time. The standard time allocation across the board will be five minutes. If anybody has an issue that will require significant discussion, like we had around the Antarctic program, feel free and we can always allocate more time as it goes through. But just default, it takes about 48 hours. So please, if you'd like to speak at a notary governance call, post before the call it can't be day of it can't be right before so i know that we had a couple people that were looking to talk on this call if time allows we might come back to it for the next sessions but please be mindful it needs to be that 48 hour window so we have time to process it i'll kind of pause here anybody has any questions about getting on the agenda for these calls All right We have two big open issues that we're gonna kind of talk about now before we move on. I'll speak to Phil Plus Day coming up on June 7th and Deep will talk about issue 509 with the multi-sig with the LDNs. So on the last notary governance call, we had kind of flagged that we have this new meeting that's coming up. It's called Phil Austin, it's taking place June 7th and June 8th in Austin, Texas. So if you were looking at an excuse to come out to uh, Texas, need some tri-tip and bear, very, very hot weather. The invitation is on the table. If you were curious to participate in this program, either as an attendee or as seeing a topic, that's what this Airtable link is right here. So I'm going to post this in chat. Sorry, I'll do this while Deep is talking. And what we're looking for is feedback on if you will be watching that recording session or if you would like to see it live or if you'd like to attend. What we're tentatively planning on having is June 7th, Phil Plus Day. We're tentatively looking at from 8 a.m. to noon Pacific time, which for those of you that are watching from the Asian GCN area, that's just around the time that we are right now. So we're trying not to keep you up too, too late as we go through it. The goal of this session is to have small breakout rooms for the live attendees and make this more of a collaboration discussion versus just one presenter model. So you might see some presentations like the one you're in right now, where you have a presenter like myself that's giving you information. The goal of this Filecoin Plus sessions that we're having on the 7th will be smaller teams, more community discussions and alignment on like what's next for the program. So again, if you have thoughts or feedback, there's the Airtable link, we'll put it into chat here shortly. This will be the place to kind of voice if you'd like to see a topic discussed, if you'd like to attend it live, or if you'd like to watch those sessions. I think this will be the last call 
for feedback that we make. So this will be your chance to kind of weigh in on what you'd like to see with that. So before I go on, I'll kind of pause and see if anybody has any questions about this. I just wanted to encourage people as well that, you know, this is a forum for you to share what you've been working on and what you've learned and what you've done in the Falcon Plus ecosystem as well. Uh, to give you an example, last time around when we did the Falcon Plus day, uh, you know, the team from uh, various like dashboards like philplus.info came and presented. Uh, and then we had a couple of people that wanted to showcase their projects in the community. Uh, so Phil Swan was there and talked about their data onboarding tool I know many of you in here are working on a variety of different tools, either that directly influence um, the clients that might be coming into the network today or serve as abstractions or are just interesting Web3 projects that at the end of the day will either support verified deal making in the network or support verified clients from coming in into the network. And so if you're working on anything that you think you'd like to showcase, you know, here's your opportunity to have a dedicated audience, a high quality recording that will be put on YouTube. Uh, and your chance and your team's chance to share some progress that you're making. Uh, so if you're interested in presenting, even if it's 10, 15 minutes, a few slides, take a few questions. I think it's well worth the effort, well worth the time. Uh, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to, to carve that time out for you. Uh, so again, in, in, in su summary, quote unquote, you know, we'll have the types of sessions where it's a little bit more like, here's where the program is at, what the state of the program is, where it's headed. But we definitely also want to encourage people that are working on projects and interesting challenges uh, to come share the progress that they've made. Uh, and so I'm, I see many of you on the list that I think would, you know, would be interested in that. And so I expect to hear from you. No pressure. Uh, I'm not going to call names this time. No pressure. No pressure indeed. All right. If anybody has any questions or topics, I know we have the link there in the air table. There's also a node field. So if you'd like to see something, that'd be great. Or as always, just send us a DM. We'll be happy to help further that. All right, on to we 509. Do, you, we, oh, we do have a question in the chat on um, it being live. So technically, we are still figuring out the exact format that we want to be in. But yes, the ex there will definitely be a live session and there will definitely be some kind of streaming for the people that can't physically make it. Uh, so please mark it on your calendar, even if you can't physically be there. Um, and then depending on if you'd like to present or not, you don't, again, you don't have to physically be there for that. We will find a way for, for this to work. Uh, I know many of us are located in different regions in the world. It's not so easy to travel for one or two days. Uh, and so we'd like to make this as inclusive as possible. So this, this form that Kira is pushing is for us to figure out if you can make it but, or, or cannot make it, but still want to participate so we can accommodate and change um, our settings and configuration and the type of room we'll use and the audio and visual equipment that we will invest in for this event. Cool. I see West Labs uh, unmuted. Uh, West Labs, do anything you want to ask or add? West Labs. Okay, guess not. No worries. We can keep going, I guess, Kara. Yeah. Yeah. So, Deep, I'll turn it over to you. The next issue is the uh, 509. Nice. Um, just drop that link in the chat for those of you that want to follow along. A um, little bit of context here. Uh, for those of you that were around a year ago, it's about this time when we kicked off the LDN idea. And the way that it was kicked off initially, if you remember, was we'll have seven notaries that self elect to be signers. Uh, for a specific issue. And so a client would apply, seven notaries would have to su suggest that they're interested in working with that client. Um, out of that, there would be quote unquote, a lead notary elected, and the seven had to be from different regions. Uh, and then the, the signer threshold at that time was also two, uh, but the idea was basically that like each allocation required two out of that seven. Um, but in order to get to that stage, seven had to have participated. Um, this was moving, but it was moving extremely slowly. Like we had, I think just a handful of applications, like probably around uh, 30 or so in total uh, in about three months time. And, and between all of them, it was just like still hundreds of tebby bytes of data cap, uh, not peppy bytes. And so when, when we did an audit pass on the design of the system in September, I think we generally realized that there was a much 
uh, it was actually before September, it was August. We, we had a bunch of ideas on how we could actually change the structure. And there was a proposal in August and September on what we call like LDN V2, which is the idea that effectively every notary could be on every multi-sig. Uh, and the reason for that is every notary should have the right to do due diligence when they are able to do due diligence and a client should not be blocked on the availability of the initial notaries that they selected. Um, this resulted in like massive scale up of the operation, uh, lots of people coming in. Uh, I don't think that this change necessarily was the reason people started using the LDN, but LDN certainly as a construct became very, very popular after this. Um, part of switching from the first version to the second version was a bunch of manual work where we shut down all the first ones and had to create a bunch of the new ones. And when we created the new ones, there was yet another challenge around when we did notary elections because the set of notaries changed, which means the number of people on the multi-sig should increase. And it's doing a disservice to clients who apply too early because then they are stuck with a smaller notary pool or less available people who want to sign their application. And so we were in this situation where we were doing a lot of like manual overhead uh, to create new LDNs and, and we stood up new ones, deleted old ones and replaced them with the new ones. And this worked when, when it was like 20, 30 applications, but now we're at like 200 plus applications uh, and it, it would be extremely painful to do this. The tooling is not easy to do with GitHub. We'd lose a bunch of our audit trail. Uh, and so LDN V3 is the idea that we have uh, come up with in terms of uh, suggesting that we move to yet another different model uh, to continue with the momentum that we have on the LDN program, but to not get stuck with no election. So specifically, this is targeted to solve the problem of us going from about 20, 22 active notaries to like 50 plus active notaries and not having notaries manually sign people being added to their multi-sig because creating new multi-sigs and doing the whole removal and reallocation is very, very painful because then we have to loop in root key holders that are also not as, as attentive as like notaries that are participating day in and day out. Um, and so those are the two options, right? Either we delete and recreate 300 LDNs or we get no existing notaries to sign in new notaries onto their multi-sigs. Uh, the second path would result in close to 4,000 messages needing to be signed. Uh, which would also be a tremendous overhead and would take a lot of time. Like we struggle as it is with several like tens of signatures that need to go through on a weekly basis to ensure clients are receiving data cap. Uh, and so Galen proposed this. He can't be here today, so I'm sort of sharing on his behalf. But the idea here is instead of having one dedicated multi-sig per client, we move into one big consolidated LDN that applies for multiple clients. And so um, the application flow for a client doesn't change. It, this is purely the mechanism of how, like where the data cap actually goes from. Uh, so just to repeat that, instead of having a dedicated notary per client address, we have one dedicated large data set notary that issues data cap to every client address that's participating in the program. Um, and so this, this would be one LDN that would go and get data cap as needed. And the top up would happen on the LDN from the root key holders. And so like roughly every two to three weeks, we would expect that the root key holders would need to re-add allocation back into the LDN. And this would be some number around 20 or 25 heavy bytes, I believe is what Galen proposed, uh, which is roughly today's like two week run rate for data cap allocations. Um, and then the LDN multi-sig itself would have every single notary, uh, including those that were elected in the third round of elections that is just wrapping up. So there would be 53, I think of those plus several notaries that were participating from the past round of elections, but did not need to reapply. So roughly about 60. And then for admin purposes, we would probably add uh, Gil and Kerry and I as public signers so that we can ma manage the removal and addition of new notaries. And ideally over time, the admin team also grows and we have more people helping with participation. But through tooling, we'd have this clear sort of admin type signer whose job is it is to remove and add notaries from that pool. Uh, and than the actual notaries where there's gonna be 50 plus of you. And so the hope is that we can do this relatively easily. Like we can do this relatively easily. The amount of work that's required is a little bit harder on the technical implementation between GitHub and the app and the software, but it should result in significantly less pain down the line. It should also make it easier for cases where notaries need to rotate addresses or notaries want to change who the individual is at their organization. Uh, that is participating in the Falcon Plus program because instead of them just being dropped from the entire LDN process for certain clients, they can still go back and participate for every client. And from a client perspective, 
this now means even if they applied for data cap six months ago, they now have 50 plus notaries that are willing and able to do due diligence and give them data cap as opposed to just 20. Uh, because we they don't have to go and reapply to get a new LDN. They just come through a consolidated LDN. Um, and so just to repeat, instead of having one notary multi-sig per client, we'd have one big notary multi-sig. On that, you would have every single current active notary that is interested in issuing data cap through this LDN process, as well as the governance team to ensure that we can add, remove, and modify other notary addresses and information. Um, everything else pretty much stays the same. Uh, we expect to have like a slightly less outstanding data cap. Right now, there's a lot of outstanding data cap, which means each each LDN has like you know between one and five pebby bytes, and not all of that has been allocated. Uh, and so if you have like 300 LDNs that each have one pebby byte, then you have like 300 pebby bytes of outstanding data cap. Here, we probably have in the order of magnitude of like 10 to 20. Uh, and then we just expect that the root key holders on schedule um, are able to issue new data cap to that big LDN. So yeah, we'd love to hear any reactions to that, any thoughts. I think that this is a interesting proposal in reducing overhead. I think it makes it a lot easier for us um, to ensure that notaries that are new get to participate as actively, and it ensures that clients don't suffer because of election cycles. Uh, and so I think from like a smoothness perspective, this is fantastic. From like an overall like ideal implementation, trust and security stuff, I don't think it technically mitigates any of the risks that exist in the LDN process today. Um, but I'm personally looking forward to the innovation coming out of the Falcon virtual machine to figure out how we can leverage that in the next version of this uh, to use a bunch of smart contracts and automation on chain instead of relying on uh, technology that interfaces between GitHub comments uh, and backends of a web app. But yeah, that's, that's my opinion. I'm, I'm definitely supportive of this change, but I'd love to hear from, uh, from notaries that are in the call. Exactly, Ari. That, that's exactly what we're trying to solve for. Um, for those of you that can't see the chat, uh, we had a problem with Irene where we weren't even able to add her address to the multi-sig for quite a while. There was an issue with the type of address. Uh, and then some, and similar to you, actually, there were some people that wanted to use a multi-sig. Um, and the, we had to go back and forth a bunch of times to figure out that you, know, you can't actually use a multi-sig on the LDN and all that stuff. Uh, Masaki also couldn't be a signer for a while. That's right. And so I think this should just hopefully make things way easier. Um, we do have a little bit of change in uh, like how we track data cap allocation now, because previously it was easy because we could track uh, you know, in and out from a notary basis for clients. Now we'll have to do it from a client address basis. So some of the software that people are building into dashboards will probably have to adjust if this goes through. Uh, but you know, this is a team effort. We'll work on it together. And so for those of you working on dashboards, definitely reach out in the Phil, uh, Phil Plus dashboard channel on Slack and let's chat about uh, your architecture and how it could be impacted by this. Uh, I, somebody was about to unmute and say something before I cut them off. I'm very sorry. Please come back. Oh, uh, that was me. I was just, this James. Uh, I was just going to say that this makes a lot of sense since if large data caps are just being blocked by notaries who go inactive, then, well that defeats the purpose yeah exactly um and then you know now that we also are generally like doing a better job tracking notary uh, performance and uh engagement uh, we also have the option of like saying okay like you know are, do you want to participate in the ldn are you interested in, in spending the next one month in ldn and then not you know it, it ends up being much more tunable to the individual needs and preferences of the notaries at a given point in time um Clarifying question in the chat from Sky. Single multi-sig mean only one notary to sign? No, the signing policy doesn't change. Uh, single multi-sig just means one multi-sig address from which the data cap goes out. So we'll have one verifier address on chain. Uh, the policy for the signature stays the same. Still need multiple signatures. Uh, still need like new uh, notaries looking at your application each time and participating. Um, Eric, come back, sir. What's up? Oh, you already got uh, yeah. the answer. What's yeah, that? I already got the answer. So same question with the Sky Liu. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense to you, Eric? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm like to clarify. So uh, uh, still we need uh, multi sign. I mean, two more notary to sign, but one first for the propose and the second for approve, right? Correct. Okay, honestly, so it's, it's the same as same as it is today. Just that instead of you know F one two three four five for client A and F six seven eight nine ten for client B, which both have multi, the, you know, both are multi six with all the notaries. We would just have F one 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 one. And that would sign for client A, client B, client C, client D, kind of a thing. And just to be clear, those are made up numbers. This is not a real situation for those of you watching the recording. But um, the idea being that we just have one group of signers, so one multi-sig with all the notaries on it. And that multi-sig is responsible for issuing data cap and verifying clients for all clients applying to the LDN program. Okay, clearly, clearly understand. That's the function which uh, Kevin asked me to test, right? Uh, actually, I don't think this is live yet. I think Kevin asked you to test uh, signing in with one address and being able to sign multiple LDN. So with this design, we don't even need that anymore. Uh, but that functionality was very helpful in ensuring that from the same login to the app, you were able to sign on behalf of multiple multi-sig addresses. Uh, in the future, yeah. you would only be on one multi-sig address for LDNs. Okay, understand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course, Eric. No problem. Um, something in the chat from Cabrina. Nice proposal. When will this go live? Great question. So this is not a trivial change from a tooling perspective. This is a much easier one for us to discuss and understand and agree on as a community. Uh, but this is one that's probably going to take uh, a couple of weeks to adjust. Um, I think we're going to prioritize this as highly as we can if the community is supportive of this because uh, this unblocks the third round of elections. You know, This unblocks the notaries that are excited to participate in LDN. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, uh, assuming the community is supportive. Of course, we also want to make sure that the community has time to react and have their thoughts. So if you guys are supportive of this, you know, Irene, Jesse, Fabman, I see, I see thumbs from you guys. Can you please share that in, in, in the GitHub uh, issue as well? Because those people that were not able to make it to the call, um, I'd love to have you share your support asynchronously. Uh, and that way we can also try and move this one a little bit quicker because I think that this will be very helpful and important for several people. Uh, so I would really appreciate, um, you know, your participation in the discussion itself uh, directly on the issue in GitHub. Any other questions or thoughts on this one? Sweet. Carry it over to you. All right. So it was brought to my attention. If you join this call late, you might not have seen the link to list for your participation. So I'm going to repost this link for marking that you came to this session for your SLA for time for notaries. So just again, one last chance to say, hey, I was here so we can mark you down. So. We had a member of the community, Meg from Holon, put together a very detailed proposal due to the time zones that we live in in a worldwide community. She can't be on this call, but she will be on the second. And in her stead, Deep and I will present a little bit about the topic. I'll take the first crack at it, and then Deep will talk about this in secondary. So on behalf of Meg from the Holon, it's a notary, this is her proposal that she posted she'd like to discuss. Essentially, what she's looking at is three segments that you see on the screen. The first is the proposal, the second is what it will impact, and the third is the ask of what she's coming about. And so what she's seeing is that there is a lot of business development that is currently taking place to onboard onto the network. And since that data from the Filecoin Plus program was designed to be open, transparent, and the role of the notary was to keep that going on, how does this new enterprise look where we might have private data that's coming on? And how does that private data weigh in to like this process as we go through it? So what she's seen is that more of these requests may be coming from the community and how do we attempt to scope this properly? And so what she's talking about is an enterprise program which she's calling File E and they're trying to look at exploring what is the due diligence look like as a notary? How much time should be spent what should those investigations look like to make sure that there's no trust or privacy violations? And then secondly, what kind of data 
should be coming onto the network? Is it sensitive? Is it regulation? How is that data looked at? So this proposal will be exploring that. And then what are the responsibilities of the clients as well as stakeholders? How will they be playing a role in this data? And then how will we mitigate risks and make sure that this isn't abused by someone who's doing this kind of business development that's coming across? And then defining what are the goals that can be looked at? So what's nice is that this is coming from a strictly community standpoint. This is Meg who's leading this charge, and what she wants to look at as she goes forward. And so what she's asking for on the right-hand side is the ask on how this will take part. So what she'll be doing is sending out pulse checks. So she might be sending this to you as a notary or you as a client. I think she's looking on five of each side. So she might be reaching out for interviews. The second is a map of what does the journey look like from the time that you come on board to what does it go back? And then she might be putting together an advisory board to explore that in more detail. The third is putting together a proposal that could be reviewed and discussed. And so she'd like to have a presentation time at that Bill Plus session we talked about on June 7th. You might hear more about this. And then talking about how the foundation might play in. So once this gets put together, she'd like to hear the Filecoin Foundation as well as PL's thoughts on it and how we can incorporate this into the streamlined process that we have right now. And then she'd like to put together a time commitment from that finding. So what are we doing over the next six to 12 months on our roadmap of time and resources to make sure that that comes together? So at a very high level, that's what the proposal is looking at. I'm going to pass it over to Deep for some more fine-tuned clarifications. Yeah, I actually think that was uh, quite good and very reasonable. Um, the, you know, this, this is born out of some of the situations that we're seeing uh, coming out of uh, clients and business development work that's happening today in the Falcon Plus ecosystem and the network. Uh, you know, a good example of this is the work that SEAL Storage was doing that resulted in like us pursuing like a different mechanism of bringing data cap to that client where there's like a dedicated separate path now. And so as we learn more about enterprise needs, I think we will have more special cases and we'll have to build generalizable frameworks. And so first we will go specific and niche and like edge case oriented and then bring that back and abstract it into generalizable processes that uh, can scale to enterprise needs uh, in Falcon Plus. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Meg that she's sort of taking this initiative forward and excited to work with people in the community to push this through. Um, my main call out here for you that are in the call and watching the recording is that this is also our first step at operating closer to like an actual decentralized organization with having like dedicated working groups that are carved out with individual goals. Uh, so this is also an experiment in governance. This is a chance for us to try out a new way of doing work in parallel on topics that can, like individuals in this community are interested in pursuing. Uh, and so this will be the first time we do it and hopefully the first of many, many times for many different types of topics. So just from that perspective, would recommend participating if that's something you're interested in. Uh, and so I would I would suggest, you know, if you're interested, either because of the governance of compl like complications and consequences, or because you're personally interested in bringing on enterprise data onto the Falcon network, because you are a notary that has contacts, you're a client yourself that has these needs, or you are a storage provider that would like to do business development and find enterprise clients uh, to come work with you. Uh, I think this is a very good conversation to be a part of. Uh, and so I'd highly recommend you reach out uh, to Meg. The, the third column is very informative. Uh, take a look at that again. Uh, you know, three, four main sort of calls to action for you folks. Uh, would like to get some notaries for interviews. If you're interested in that, please reach out to Meg. Uh, she'd also like an advisory board of up to 10 notaries. Uh, and then she'd like to ensure that we basically have a work plan that she'll be driving. Uh, and so for those of you that are interested, let's get you reaching out to Meg on Slack, I think a good way to do it would be probably in the Phil Plus channel. So if you just go to channel Phil dash plus, <laughs> oops, didn't mute it in time, sorry. Uh, yeah, join us in Slack and uh, reach out to Meg there. Let me know if you have any questions in this session. She'll also be presenting in the afternoon one as, as Kira already pointed out. And so you'll be able to watch the recording and, and see her go through this. Uh, just one small question. Please. Uh, so, like, do we have to have some like kind of uh, restriction on the like diversification on the notaries? Or for participating in this? Yes. It's a good like question. In, I, I, in, I like five to yeah. ten. So 
maybe have some like you, you can have like all those origins from, yeah yeah that'd be great i think that makes sense to me um just so that we have an understanding of enterprise businesses in different regions mm -hmm. um yeah i think that makes sense maybe a good way to do this is we can see who wants to participate and then if we have any gaps then we can go and request specific people I actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a thread right now in okay. the plus channel that says thread, um, please wave if you are interested with Meg. Um, sure. Okay, cool. And then um, would love if you guys sort of mark your interests in here. And then I think your point is completely fair copy if it turns out that we have this like overrepresentation. Well, actually, overrepresentation is not a problem. I think it's more that if we don't have representation from a region, it would be good to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Great, great point. Thank you. Awesome. Gary, good right. to go. Yeah, deep thanks for posting that in the Slack. That's, that's all set. So the next is we have a dedicated time for abuse consequence. So I'll turn it over to Deep. Oh yes, so I wanna talk about this um, and get like an early pulse from the community. So um, just so you guys are aware, and this is recorded. So hopefully if you didn't see this live, you're watching the recording. Uh, we've been getting a decent amount of reports in uh, emails in Slack publicly and Slack privately as well on cases of potential abuse uh, for, of the Falcon Plus system. Uh, it's awesome to see that. Thank you so much for those of you that are doing the investigation and the work. I want you to know that we're also following up on it uh, for every single one that's come in. Uh, at least me or somebody from the team has been spending the time uh, looking through it to figure out what is actionable and how we can share uh, some of this publicly. Uh, you'll start to see more questions coming on clients' applications, more questions coming on notary applications. Uh, I think initially this is more about identifying like where there's misunderstandings or if people are not sure what's happening, less about pointing figures and, and, and pointing blame at the moment, but we'd like to ensure that the community is progressing um, in, a, in a safe and healthy way. So the, the thing that I did want to bring up, though, is now we have you know the ability to remove notaries has always existed through root key holders. We also have the ability to uh, remove data cap from client addresses, which we didn't have before because of the FIP that was passed. Uh, and so I wanted to spend some time getting a pulse check on what people felt was like fair or not fair consequences for certain scenarios. Like if we find that a client is, you know, misusing their data cap and allocating it to, let's say like one SP, like too much. Uh, and it's, it's like vastly disproportionate, like 90 plus percent. Is it fair to remove data cap from that client and like block them from ever getting data cap again or should that be temporary or should we not have that and like it should be a warning first that kind of thing so specifically in the case that we find that clients are disproportionately uh, issuing data cap to the same storage provider or in the case that we find that a notary is giving data cap to clients where all the deals are being made back with that notary storage provider operation uh, i'd like to understand where people's initial reaction is of what is considered fair and not fair. Um, I don't really have an opinion on this yet, which is why this is not like an issue or a discussion topic. I'm just curious to hear what people have to say. Jesse, uh, do you want to chat through that? Uh, I just, I don't know. I think it's just fair if we do a warning first. And then if we found that it's been done again a second time, uh, we start the process of removing the data cap and then suspension for that particular round. Like, you know, he, he, he can only, he has to wait for the next round to be able to participate again. That makes sense to me. Um, one question I have for you there is, 
what do you mean by next round here? You mean the next allocation set, basically? Yep, yep. Yeah, any thoughts on that? Any reactions to that, people, or, or other ideas? Uh, I got a question. So in this kind of situation, it will come out to some kind of situation that, like, uh, he break out the rows in the last round of distribution. What should we do? Because at this time, like, warning won't. Correct. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a great question. That, that, that is one of the things I was thinking of too, because that's usually the biggest one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. So I think we we'll definitely have to think about it. I have, I have some ideas, but not very good ones. I think one is, you know, obviously that GitHub account can't get data cap again, right? For example, um, because usually they're coming in from the same place. But we could also mark, at that point, we could mark all the SPs that the client work with at, as, at risk. And if other clients continue to work with those SPs without a good reason, then that I think counts as abuse of the system. But like in my in my opinion, it's like the if and it happens, it means that these clients, uh, uh, these story providers actually know the rules and uh, violating the rules. Uh, I mean, by its means, right? So in this kind of sense, like we can maybe slash him or just not giving the last run, like like giving all. Um, I don't know, like remove all, all, all data care because he, he like do it intentionally. Yeah, but so in that case, what we do is how how quickly would you catch that? I guess is the question. Like, do we need to see 50 tabbytes of deals on chain or even 10 tabbytes of deals on chain in the same pattern before we put in the process to, to remove the rest of the data cap? Or what, like, what do you think is a good enough sample? No, I mean, just in the case, like it happens in the last round. Last round of like distribution of the data cap. It means yeah. that the you know the the story providers they're breaking the rules intentionally, right? No, yes. no. So, but how like know. how how quickly do we identify that? Like, what is the sample size that we need? Is it even? Oh, you made one deal in a way that you said you wouldn't. Mm. You get what I mean? So like, if yeah, you, yeah, I got it. So but what like, is that uh, sub interval? Uh, like, but like, how can we do it like technically? Uh, I'm not sure. It's possible because every deal, so even in our dashboards, right, every verified deal ends up as a row item. So we have dashboards mm -hmm. with every single deal. Um, and so it's a, it's a matter of automating that into a query and, and into an alert and putting that on GitHub or, or kicking off a process to remove the rest of the data cap. And so we just need to figure out like what the right, at what point should we react? Is one deal too much? Or is, if maybe there's a mistake in the automation, you know? So what about 10? What about 100? What about five tabby bytes? That's obviously, too, sorry, five tabby bytes. Um, so I'd love to sort of understand in, in your guys' opinions, like what mm -hmm. that interval, what that sub interval needs to look like with it, within the, like, the bounds of a single allocation. So in the case that we don't have another allocation to come, at what point do we react? Mm. Julian says we should remove previously. So that Julian, that would be basically doing a FIP to remove the verified status of a deal. So like finding a way to like remove the the quality adjusted power. Yes. That's a much longer process though, right? Because that's like a FIP where chain state has to change. So until we move to the a new like actor model where we can easily change this, this is going to be really difficult and could result in like a fork. Yeah, I think the Julian's ways might be best, but I cannot be done in short time. So maybe, I don't know, like at least have some like kind of blacklist that this, this, no, uh, this, I mean, story providers will not get any data cap after, I mean, right. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, then we, we can figure out how we can like identify the pattern. Yeah. NFT star Vivian, what's the definition of offenses? Good question, uh, Vivian. I think the there's a few things that we think are not good today. So a good example is if a client gets data cap and spends all that data cap with a single storage provider, 
or spends a majority of the data cap with a single search provider that is viewed as outside the sort of desires of the program to build uh, good practices for clients that distribute replicas across different search providers and also distribute the, the, the resource of data cap. Uh, another example is many notaries have storage provider operations. Uh, so if a notary is con consistently giving data cap to clients that only store data with that notary's storage providing operation, then that is also abuse of the system because that's the unfair profiteering effectively. Um, those are the two most obvious ones. Uh, there's definitely others. Uh, there's definitely we will find more complications, I'm sure. Uh, but those are the two easy examples that I would give you to answer your question. Cool. Good to hear the different ideas. I think what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to kick off a discussion topic. Um, and then Kobe, Julien, others, it would be great to get your thoughts as well. Uh, Jesse, too, um, on that discussion. So one, I'll probably have that up and running uh, after the afternoon governance call or maybe before today. If I do, I will link it in the Falcon Plus channel. Awesome. Thanks folks, back to, back to you, Kerry, if there's anything else. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I think we have about three or four minutes left. Without introducing any like broad scale discussion, I'm curious if anybody on the call has any questions from the agenda that we spoke about any of the issues that were flagged, any of the process steps coming, kind of like open forum for any questions or discussions from today's call. Right. We'll not see anybody come off mute, not see anything in the chat channel. I think what we'll do is we're going to call this as far as uh, new business is concerned. If you are keen to get on the agenda for the next governance cycle and have a presentation like the ones that we had today, please check out the notary governance repo that's here. Come under the issues, and then you'll see that there is always an issue that is created for the notary governance call. The next one will be up for the next sync that's coming in two weeks. And here is the place. Those of you that asked to be added today, what I'll do is I'll take your comment and I'll paste it into the next session. That way you kind of have a head start on getting that information in. And that way we can prioritize the agenda and syncs to get everybody a fair venue of time on. So pending that, any questions, feel free to post into the notary governance Slack channel that we have. And uh, as always, keep those questions coming. Appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you. All right, well, hello. Welcome to the second uh, governance call of April 19th. This is the 8th of 2022. And we're gonna be walking through the agenda for what we're gonna chat about tonight. So first off at a very high level, the way these calls work, if this is your first time watching or joining is we start with introductions. We'll give you an opportunity if this is your first time to say hello and we can follow up or just say hello right back. Those of you that are notaries will give you a chance to sign in for uh, credit on the SLA and just participate in the governance process. We'll dedicate a short amount of time for just metrics checking on the overall program. Then we'll talk about some frequently asked questions that have come in from the community by way of DMs or in Slack. That way everyone's tracking the big issues facing notaries. And then we have some time for community discussions on data allocation for LDNs. We have a presentation from Meg as far as a community governance plan. And then we have some open issues on conflict resolution. For the morning call, we went right on the full hour, but there's not as many of us this time. So we might have a little bit extra time for community discussions or anything you might want to add as we go through. So as far as hellos, if this is your first time, my name's Kevin. I kind of make sure that the community is running well on the program. I'm joined by Galen and Deep. Galen is out of the office today and joining some well-earned time. And Deep is on the call, and Deep can serve as the technical advisor as well as overall program, just essay guru, wonderful human being. So the two of us, Deep and myself, will be any kind of POCs from Filecoin and Protocol Labs on the call. 
this is your first time joining, whether you're a storage provider, uh, notary, new notary, uh, client looking for application, a great thing to do would be in chat, just say, hello, my name's Kevin, I'm from XYZ organization. That way we can kind of just keep tabs, say hello, or ditch anything you may need later on. Obviously, no pressure on that as we go forward. If you're a notary and you're looking to get time for your commitment to the community on a network basis per week, we're going to share this link here in chat here shortly. This is just the check in the call. So when you click that Airtable link, you'll just mark who you're with. This is exactly what the form looks like. Fill it out. Just mark today's date. You're attending the second session, your name, your role, and then that way we can just kind of track it and make sure that everyone's participating on that. So I'll post that link shortly in chat if you don't see it already, and then we'll kind of go forward on that. Just go open up chat. So we'll go. Yeah, thanks, Deep. I appreciate you putting that link for us. All right, let's talk about metrics as we go through here. Just a quick check in on where the program sits and stands. So right now, if you take a look, our average time to data cap is kind of holding steady. No remarkable changes to the network. We take about a day and 13 hours to get the data cap out the door once it's been averaged and put out there. The average time to first response, we're still standing around six days. So we take a look at the OKRs that we have for 2022. A lot of it's how do we get that process down from acknowledgement to data out the door and what can we do to streamline that? So we'll talk about that in every other governance call. We talked about that last week, if you're keen to go back and watch. And this week, we're gonna focus on some issues and not really dive into those OKRs. If you take a look at the amount of data cap that's on the network, we're still just chugging forward. It seems to be a pretty steady increase every two weeks over week. It's around that 0 0.03 petabyte mark. That's kind of significant. And we'll talk about this for the allocation on notary time as we go through this call. But as it stands for metrics, no wild takeaways, no outliers to point out. We're pretty much par for the course as we go through at the end of Q1. Hey, hey Kevin, it's Michael Fair. I was wondering maybe it's something to track would be uh, what the total data cap that is in the process of being requested is. Could be yeah, something yeah. to track. That's a That's good a flag. Good. Deep, do we have any numbers on that right now? Or is that something that would be easily put in? Yeah, so actually, Michael, the current LDN process, the way it's architected, is that like by default, if you go through the large data set notary thing, you're getting data cap committed to that account, even if it's not being dispensed to a client. Uh, so unfortunately, because of architectural decisions we've made, we've ended up accidentally tracking that metric as like the amount of data cap that's committed to clients, uh, not counting the outstanding applications to individual notaries themselves. Uh, but a majority of the data cap requests coming in are via the LDN process. And so that 300 petabyte ish number is effectively the data cap that's ready to be deployed to clients, um, which was requested by clients, but has not necessarily made its way over to client addresses today. Uh, and so we do actually have that. Um, that will go away, <laughs> probably. Uh, I think we need to overhaul the system and do it a little bit more correctly. And so when that does happen, I think we will need to make a more concerted effort to track this as an like an independent metric and actually state it that way. Uh, so I think, yeah, plus one great flag. Uh, we happen to have it kind of today. Uh, we probably won't if we don't actively choose to in the future. And so let's uh, consciously make that choice to make that, uh, to surface that up. Okay, got it, thanks. Cheers. And anyone else on the call, if you ever have questions as we go through, feel free to just stop, post in chat, voice it. This is a community call, not just like a monotone lecture. So Michael, appreciate you flagging that. So as far as notary process goes, the next couple slides talk about some of the direct messages I've gotten over the last couple of days, as well as some of the Slack threads that you might have seen. We thought it might be worthwhile to take a moment or two and just kind of address these as community rather than answering them one off or in a silo, or goodness, if you're like me, you probably have a thousand Slack messages. Goodness knows it's almost impossible to keep track. So here's some of the frequently asked questions that have come across from notaries, from storage providers and clients over the last two weeks that we thought it might be valuable to take a couple of moments and just highlight for the community. The first is we had notary issue 490. It was proposed about four weeks ago and the root of this issue was rather than allocating data cap at a three, four petabyte level for new notaries, cap it by region for each notary at one petabyte. And that would carry across the board, regardless of location or regardless of the amount that you asked. So what this means is if you ask for 50 terabytes, you get 50 terabytes. But if you ask for three, two, four petabytes, it's all capped at one. 
And so the question came back from someone is like, hey, did I do something wrong on my application? Or hey, was there a problem? No, it's no problem at all. The reason why we propose this change or why we're implementing on the network, it's three core reasons, which you see on the slide. The first is that this is the average data cap that was requested by all notaries. We went through the applications that looked, one petabyte seems to be about the norm that's being used. Two, this is a geographic distribution across all regions. So that means if we have someone in Asia GCN and there's 15 that all request four petabytes and we have different notaries in different regions, it becomes really unbalanced. So this way does a good job of keeping everything on the seesaw. And the third and final reason for this is that we now have an avenue for notaries and clients to request larger data cap outside of that process through LDN. So it really negates the purpose to have these massive allocations to each notary, which if we looked at the metrics from last round, gets really difficult to allocate and can count against scores for notaries in the fourth election. So we proposed this in issue 490. We discussed this on the last call. We updated all of the applications that came through to reflect this. I just wanted to highlight, no one's being dinged. All the data cap is still allocated. Just wanted to take time. If anybody has any questions on this, I'll kind of pause and open it up for discussion. Cool. Um, I just want to add to this as well, that like in line with uh, pushing better practices on governance and ensuring that we're opening closing issues out and like following up and, and doing our best to adhere to a timeline to ensure people feel enabled. Um, unless somebody flags anything at this governance call, given the support we got at the previous round of governance calls, as well as like on, on GitHub, uh, I'm going to go ahead and mock this as approved and enable like the, the adding of the net new set of notaries. Uh, so yeah, if you if you have a you know dissenting opinion or would like to share a new perspective that you didn't get the, the chance to on GitHub or at the previous governance call, uh, giving you a couple of seconds now. Um, and those of you watching the recording, you know if you don't agree with this change necessarily, then one please in the future track uh, the GitHub repo. That's why we're going to be ensuring that async updates do happen. And then to uh, feel free to open up another one if you'd like to propose something different or a better model for our community to use for this specific sub problem in the future. That's a, that's a one sip water break break. <laughs> There's still exactly. silence. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it. All right. The second question that we've seen come through in the last two weeks is, hey, I'm a notary. When do I get the data allocation? Or, hey, I'm a new notary. When will I receive my initial data allocation and onboarding? So to kind of check in on this, where we stand right now, is we're still processing the applications that have been received. Just for context, we've essentially doubled the network of notaries that are participating in the process, which has essentially quadrupled the amount of like administrative tracking. So what I'm in the process of doing right now is taking all of the applications on GitHub and Airtable, putting them in a unified place and making sure that everything lines up for comps. We're taking a little bit of time to do this Carrie, I think we've lost you, or maybe that's just me. Can people hear him? No. Okay. Timing really well. No, Gary. Oh no, did I drop? You, okay, you're back. We hear yeah. you totally fine. Do you yeah. mind restating what you said? Yes. <laughs> I appreciate yes. that. No good. Uh, no good Wi-Fi in 2022. <laughs> uh, the, the pivot was it's taking a while to get everyone squared away. So here's the three things we're doing right now. If you are a new notary, you would have seen your GitHub issue come through. If you haven't responded, we've sent a ping and I'll send one more ping. There's a couple of outstanding GitHub issues that we have yet to receive the acknowledgement. So we'll send one more ping out today and tomorrow. And then we'll kind of follow up with the best practices on what to do with some of those that we haven't heard from. Everybody else, if this is your first time in the notary process, No. Okay, come back. You're like everyone else is the first time in the notary process. Oh, you're back. I heard you sigh. Oh. <laughs> All right, deep. Just in case I do cut, you've got yeah. that. All right. So you're going to see some new slacks come through. You're going to see some GitHub pings. If you have any questions, feel free. 
And the next step that we'll be doing is providing all notaries with a step-by-step -step checklist on how to check a GitHub repo, on how to update Slack, on how to check your fill allocation and how to make those withdrawals. So we'll be sending that out over the next couple of days. Check your inbox. If you have any questions, please keep it coming. But as the process stands, once we get all the notaries in, then we'll allocate that data out. Just want to add one more thing to that. We, you know, notary elections are uh, an, an inflection point for this community. I didn't get to share this at the call in the morning, uh, but I did want to share this right now. And hopefully people watching the morning will catch up. Either way, uh, this is going to be public knowledge very soon. We are working on trying to build a tool that helps with automating some of these checks and ensuring that like software and hardware is configured correctly. So just like, uh, you know, how, are you using your ledger right? Are you, is your address correctly mapped to your ledger? Are you sending messages in the way that's expected? Uh, are you able to send and receive messages or send and receive funds? Uh, and so we want to get that stuff done in a way that it scales. Because uh, last time around, it was either you know, sitting in office hours with me uh, and dealing with that, which is always a painful experience, or uh, trying it yourself and banging your head against the wall for several hours before it finally randomly started working one day. Uh, and so we're doing our best to mitigate these things. So uh, apologies to the old notaries because yeah, you've been through hell and back for this, but hopefully the experience will be disproportionately better and we'll continue to go that in that direction uh, for inbound and upcoming notaries. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Danny, your question in the chat, can old notaries join the onboarding? Of course you can. Uh, all of this is going to be open to everybody. Even non-notaries theoretically, if they figured out how to, could have gained access to this, not that it would have been useful for them, uh, but yes. Thanks for that, Deep. And anyone on the call, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out, either DM the notary channel or on the Phil Plus, and we'll be happy to get you whatever we can. All right, two more FAQs that came through. This one is a few weeks ago, we got a flag and it was really valid. And it was the fact that the Phil Plus channel had become bombarded with requests for data review. And so we had a proposal on GitHub repo to set up a dedicated channel for reviewing of applications. There was no dissenting opinion, so we stood up that channel and it's kind of been slowly gaining traction without a formal push for adoption. I've been waiting to push all of the notaries into this channel until we've onboarded, until we had like a formal SOP on how to handle it. But just to make you aware is almost like a soft launch is that we have this channel now, this fill plus application review. And so if anybody posts in the public channel saying, hey, where's my data cap allocation? I politely send them a DM, say, love it, please post in this channel. And I move their comment to that. So as we allocate the data, as we do more with the onboarding, we'll be adding notaries to this channel. I want to stress that this is just pings. Do not feel actioned by this channel. We still have the formal process for the GitHub. We still have the formal review. So consider this just one token or one memento in the arsenal. But the GitHub repository will still be the source of truth for those pings that go through, as well as the fill plus. So any questions on this, feel free to post it in Slack. And I'll pause one more time if anyone has comments. All right. A lot of, a lot of compliments in the chat for you today, Kerry. Oh, you're so sweet, Deep. <laughs> this is the last one, I promise, and we'll head it over to the wonderful Deep. So one of the, the flags that we had is, how do I get time on this agenda for a presentation or discussion? So the best way to do it is to go into the GitHub repository that we have set up under notary governance. After every call, I'll make an issue and I'll title it, hey, next call, April 25th or May 3rd, whatever the date will be. And I'll ask if you'd like to present. We have a cutoff of about 48 hours before the presentation, today's call that we're on. And that's just for real talk, just sanity. So we have a time to review what you'd like to talk about, put it on the agenda, allocate the time. And so if there was anything you want to bring up, the best way is to make a repository or feel free to send us a ping on Slack. That's why we have Slack. And just say, hey, I'd like to have time to discuss with my community team. Perfect. We'll put it on the agenda. So I apologize. There was a few that came in this morning and late last night. If you're on the call and you were looking to present, super apologies. If we have time, I'll definitely see if we can get you in. But what I'll do is I'll shift all those requests onto the first call in May, and I'll send you a DM on Slack, and if I have it in the GitHub, 
to make sure you have time. But this is the best way going forward just to keep the sanity a little bit cleaner as we continue to scale. All right, all right, all right. So with that, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna go into open issues followed by community talk. So we have two open issues. I'm gonna to speak to the first and Deep will speak to the second. So the first one is, hey, looking forward to seeing you guys on June 7th and June 8th is Filecoin Plus Day and Phil Austin. So we'll start with Phil Austin and work our way back. We talked about this on the last call. This is an in-person gathering taking place for everything Filecoin. It happens June 8th in Austin, Texas. So if you were curious about attending, we're going to post the links here in Slack or excuse me, chat very quickly. And it's essentially a gathering of everything Filecoin. The day prior, we are going to have a fill plus day. There's also a link that Deep just put into the chat. And we're trying to gain a little bit of insight on how you would like to participate in that. So that survey that you see that air table link, that just says, I'd like to come in person or I can't meet in person, but I'll watch the recording or I'll watch it live. So gear it in a format that I could watch it live. This really matters because if we get a hundred people that say they want to watch it live, we're going to index off that and do everything possible to make that live stream as engaging as possible. If we get a lot of answers that I'll just watch the recording, we're going to make the post as engaging as possible. So we're going to bias for people that are attending this call and take action off your feedback and prioritize that. So please, 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 please fill out that form. And if there's a session you'd like to talk about or showcase your product or showcase your thoughts for the future, we're definitely allocating time for the community on this one. The goal of this presentation is to not be just like a monotone four hour PowerPoint heavy, just watch this and bleed. It's meant to be more of like, what are the collaboration sessions? Where is the alignment happening? How do we scale this program as we go forward? So a lot of really good keynotes, a lot of really good discussions what we have planned. But if I put, I get an insight. I'll kind of pause if anybody has questions. <laughs> Just laughing, Tom. All right, with that, uh, you want to five oh nine. Yes, I'd love to. Just, oh, I put the wrong link in the chat. Hold on. Let me sort that real quick. 509. All right. Um, so a little bit of context on this issue. Uh, you know, for those of you uh, that have been around for quite a while, you'll remember that it was about almost exactly a year ago that we first started talking about having an LDN process. Uh, and the first design that shipped uh, in May, June was a mechanism whereby seven notaries would self-select uh, into choosing to be the notaries for an application of which we'd have a lead notary and then we'd cycle to pairs of signatures to get that data cap out. Uh, we learned very, very quickly that that process wasn't scaling uh, and made some changes in what we have, you know, called in the past like LDN V2, uh, which is this idea that the upfront setup cost is automated as much as possible. Uh, and that the, the signature threshold still require is still the same, where we require two notaries to be on board each time a client gets data cap. Uh, but we don't need that layer of like seven notaries to say yes first, uh, because the due diligence should theoretically still happen like downstream. And, and we're doing our best to supplement the work that a notary might manually do with automation and data tracking and stuff. Here proposed is actually LDN v3. Uh, where we want to propose yet another set of tweaks in how the process is actually going through. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through the logic for this a little bit. Uh, and so you're already familiar with the fact that, you know, there's about 200 issues in the large data sets notary repo. Uh, each of those is corresponding to a, a notary address that's been established on chain, uh, which has a set of signers on it, functions as a multi-sig with a threshold of two. Those signers are basically the set of notaries that were elected in the last election cycle. Um, when we rotated from LDN v1 and v2 or needed to onboard notaries in the past, the mechanism for doing this was actually to create a new multi-sig, shut down the previous multi-sig, remove data cap from it, 
create a new one and move the client over to doing that. Uh, and that was a bunch of overhead, but at the scale of like 10 or 20 LDN applications, it wasn't so bad. It was still like, you know, several hours. But then when you're talking 200 applications, um, it starts to look not as exciting. And so then the alternate option is, oh, why don't we, instead of redoing the infra for every single client application, why don't we add all the new notaries to the existing LDNs and the existing scaffold? And the problem with that is because it is a multi-sig in the Filecoin world that still requires the same amount of messages and thresholds to be met. And so that means a notary on an existing LDN would have to propose each net new notary to be added to that multi-sig. Uh, and then another notary would have to approve it and it would happen one by one for each incremental notary being added. We're about to go from like 23-ish active notaries to like 60 um, cause you know, 53 people got approved through this last process of which like a handful didn't ask to be renewed, but are still continuing to participate. And so probably closer to, you know, mid fifties, high fifties, total number of people that need to get on this. And so you're talking 3,000, 4,000 messages that have to be sent in coordination synchronously to pull this off. Um, this also then led us to think about a bunch of downstream effects that have happened because of the architecture choices we made. And so, uh, you know, Michael, uh, the point that you brought up early in this call, it was a little bit of serendipity, a little bit of luck that it worked out in our favor, but really in pretty much every other way, uh, the architecture is not super efficient uh, in terms of uh, tracking client behavior over time, tracking notary behavior over time, rewarding performant notaries for the work that they're doing, having better safety uh, and risk uh, tolerance and throttles built into the system, uh, ensuring that when admin work needs to be done on the system, it can easily be done. And as we think about like, Falcon Plus maturing even further towards working as a DAO, leveraging like technology like the Falcon virtual machine uh, in the future and automating a lot of the work uh, as well as automating the IO from the network and network data. Uh, we wanted to think about another iteration that we could take on how the LDN is architected uh, to be a little bit more effective, a little bit easier overhead and more efficient at doing what it needs to do. And so TLDR with all this context, the main proposal that Galen outlines in this issue is moving from one notary multi-sig per client application to one single really big LDN. That is the general case LDN for every client application that fits within that scope. Uh, so specifically, this does not include special case applications where we're, we're still learning about and setting precedents, um, as well as like things we may learn through the, the enterprise investigation work that Meg is driving. But for the generic case LDN, which is pretty much like 175 plus applications today, uh, we are proposing going through one single LDN. And that LDN will have every single notary on it. This includes the previous people that were elected, even if they didn't go to the recent election cycle, but are still active notaries and want to say active notaries, as well as everybody going through the active uh, election process right now. And, uh, you know, the quote unquote governance team, which is uh, Kere, Galen, and I. Uh, and the intent is that the three of us are on there as signers for the admin stuff. So if people need to rotate addresses, want to leave, want to join, we do another round of elections, we can try and now automate that through wallets that we have access to and can can bake that into the tooling uh, where we can do that in a slightly higher throughput, uh, lower chance of failure way. And then for all the clients that are coming in, their applications still get tracked the same way, the work is still done similarly, but the notary that's actually giving them the data cap on chain is a single address on the network as opposed to multiple addresses. So all of you, would be on a single big LDN. Uh, and then there would be a refresh loop on that LDN where uh, the, the design proposed by Galen is roughly about two weeks worth of the run rate of data cap. And so about 25 heavy bytes of data cap, uh, we'd request to the root key holders in an automated fashion to keep that topped up. Uh, and we'd have like a, a sort of single funnel of data cap going into all of the clients for that generic case LDN, as opposed to having multiple LDNs needing to be set up and managed and bringing in the root key holders and, and doing all the on-chain auditing for like that setup process every single time. Uh, and so the hope is that this will reduce a bunch of the operational overhead, reduce some of the risk, uh, not take on too much new net risk, uh, make it a lot easier for people that have issues. Like we had, we, we had notaries that couldn't sign applications for like three, four months because they had issues with the ledger or couldn't figure out how to like sign stuff correctly or needed to change addresses and things like that. Um, and it also allows us to build some efficiency in the client onboarding process where uh, it leads itself, it lends itself even more to automation, lends itself even better towards like tracking notary action and behavior uh, in line with engagement and pro uh, in program metrics that we're trying to do today. And hopefully the next time we do elections and we get a whole bunch of new people, uh, it's significantly less painful than what we had to do last time. And so 
this personal opinion, if you couldn't already tell, I'm a very big fan of this idea. Uh, but of course, I'd love to hear from some of the notaries uh, that are in the call today, as well as other community members, like what your thoughts are on something like this. Uh, I paste a link to the issue in chat. Um, threw a lot of information at you. And so even if you just have clarifying questions that I can help sort out, we'd love to do that. And we can take the conversation into GitHub. Uh, but I do think that this would be a, a good next step in terms of you know bringing us one step closer to on-chain smart contracts, uh, enabling notaries to make decisions in policy setting for client verification and data cap allocation. And uh, it brings us down from hours of overhead for introducing and managing notaries to minutes, ideally. Uh, and so I'm, I'm quite excited about this opportunity. Um, Galen wrote this, drafted this, came up with the idea. Uh, he's unfortunately not able to be here today and is spending some time off, as uh, Kerry mentioned. Uh, and so I'm here and instead presenting this to you. Uh, Deep, I have a question. Uh, love automation. This is great. What, how would it change what the notaries do? So we go check that um, GitHub repo. We scan for the LDNs that we're doing due diligence on. What would it change for us? Almost nothing, um, in because from your perspective, like instead of the tooling tracking a notary address and the obligations to that notary address, it's now going to have to track the client request and the obligations for that client to a central notary thing. And so all of this would be abstracted out. Effectively, you'd be doing the same thing where there's a client application coming into an issue, you're still tracking and doing the back and forth with other notaries and clients in their issue. Uh, and then the tooling is checking for on a per client basis, uh, doing the proposals and the approval suggestions to you through the same app. Uh, and so almost nothing changes for you. And we still, you know, the approval threshold is still two. The type, the set of notaries that could still sign it still stays the same. Uh, the UI is practically the same. We might add a column somewhere for transparency. Um, and then from a data cap, uh, issuance tracking perspective, I think a little bit more work needs to be done uh, because we, we can't now rely on like the simplistic, oh, just look at the notary address and you'll know how much data cap the client used uh, or how much uh, we'll now have to like actually look at a per allocation per message basis, which address it went to, do a bunch of like deduplication and, and, and have some more uh, complication on how that'll pan out. And so the dashboards that sort of are existing today, I think that's where a, a lot of the work will go in to make sure that they stay updated. Um, and then of course, like, I think the tooling overhead here is the real change. Like it's, this is not a difficult change from like a behavioral perspective. I think this is a much more technically complex one than, than, than ones we've done before. And so it will probably take a couple of weeks to pull off. Uh, but I think it's well worth it. Good. Sounds good. Any other questions on this? Any flags, suggestions, thoughts? We love throwing really complicated things at you and then holding you hostage to tell us something. So just kidding. Feel free to hit up issue 509 um, and let us know what you think. I see uh, Alex is also on the call. Hey, Alex, I know you had mentioned uh, you had some questions around the implementation of this. If there's anything you wanted to bring up uh, about this, happy to chat about it right now as well. I'm gonna take that as a sign of nope. Cool, Gary, back to you. Actually, one last ask. For those of you that are supportive of this change, um, given that it will be technically complex, well, I'd like to start working towards it as soon as possible. So would appreciate like a signal uh, of affirmation in GitHub uh, so that we get a pulse check that it is making sense for people. So that way we can at least start thinking about design, implementation, and timeline. Uh, and so, if you are supportive or if you have open questions, this is one that we'd like to move towards a little bit quickly, especially because it'll, we'd like to ideally enable the new notaries to sign LDNs through this path. Uh, of course, if that timeline doesn't work out, then no problem, we'll figure out an alternative, but this would be the ideal path forward. And so um, some combination of the existing LDN process plus this will probably coexist for a couple of weeks before we can you know, move towards this for almost everything but the special cases. Thank you all. This is a final check-in on the participation. The way that Zoom works is if you join this call after we share the link, I know the chat will not allow you to go back. 
So I'm going to post the login one last time for anybody who might have joined late that wants to log in is coming to this call. And with that, we have a guest speaker today to speak on the new proposal for the enterprise program. So big thank you to Meg from, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks guys. Uh, if you just wanna go to the second slide, there's only one. We, it's kind of maybe a nice way because we were just talking about um, the large changes to sort of man manage large data sets. This proposal is stimulated by both sides of the market, actually, um, for storage providers that are doing business development and making and, and hunting down sort of Web3 aware clients. We are finding that they wouldn't qualify for File Plus. However, it's not a fully featured on parity solution compared with what they currently have. So they'll need some incentive to onboard as early adopters. So we would love to expand the, uh, you know, this opportunity to sell um, or onboard useful data beyond just public data. So that is the column on the left-hand side. This is the explanation for why we would be proposing something like this. We're seeing demand um, and we think it can scale commercialization. The middle column is what is it? So what is it is just another iteration of file plus. So it could be file E or file enterprise or, or whatever um, fabulous marketing name that the team may come up with. But essentially it is um, shifting of the, the major changes are going to be a shift on due diligence away from data because that would be a violation of trust and privacy. So we're talking about enterprises that have data that is internal or may have privacy requirements. It has a classification that is not public. It's not a public archive. It's not cultural or art or some of the um, data sets that we've seen already go onto the network, but it's internal commercial and confidence. However, they want to diversify or they want a multi-cloud multi storage strategy and they're interested in, in looking at a decentralized model. Um, but the two major differences are going to be the shift will be from um, due diligence on the data just because it would be a violation of trust and, and um, privacy. And, and the second one is around... Um, well, so that involves KYC, but the second one is around data classification. So how do we handle data that's not public? So the two big considerations that we'll need to go into is the design that we'll need to solve for is how do we verify a client over, over their data or their use case? And how would we handle their data, classify it and align with any compliance and regulatory com, um, requirements? So that's the first two columns. That's a breakdown of, of why and what. And how it will work is we no, I'm not doing this in isolation. So the first stage is just a bit of a pulse check on file plus today. So let's understand what's working and what's not working. Some of these things may contribute to um, an evolution or improvement in the file plus program for this iteration for enterprise. Uh, so we, we've got cohorts of notaries, uh, we've spoken to Falcon Foundation Protocol Labs, storage providers, and the last big gap is still clients. So um, I'll remind me at the end to nudge you guys about that. So we, we're going to collect some data about what they think is working and not working on experience. I've almost got my cohort for notaries. I've spoken to a few storage providers but could do a few more, but clients is the only other gap. I'm working with um, Joa if he's on the call today, which I think he joined the earlier one, um, to map out a, a customer journey. So we've had a look at what the file plus one looks like and we're designing one for what the new enterprise would also look like. Customer journeys are so great because they help you see where all the gaps are. So what happens at this stage and this step and this drop off? So we're using both a draft proposal, so something that's written, and also uh, a customer journey that shows all the actors that are involved in the process. And then the desire is to include or set up a, um, 
an advisory board. So I've got here 10 notaries, but it, it would be great to actually in, include a spread of um, storage providers as well. So notaries, storage providers, and potentially when we get into an MVP phase, a separate client advisory board that helps us co-create it together. But, but I'm looking to set this um, initial notaries and storage providers if they, they're keen to join starting from next week. So we will be having probably regular um, weekly sessions just to talk through what the design is and some of the challenges and how do we ideate, ideate around them. And then um, the draft proposal will go to, I'd like it to go to the community on the file plus day. I've got 6th of June here. Um, but is it the 7th? Have I got the wrong? Yeah, I think it's the 7th. No sweat okay. though. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, the time frame. We've got roughly uh, two months to get our, our drafts together. And I think the thing to impress is that we don't know everything. We won't know everything. We won't be able to solve everything. But uh, you will see in the proposal. So I've worked in um, human centre design practice for a while. And one of the really great techniques that we use is uh, co-creation. So we start in a couple of phases. We start in an MVP phase and we work through the design using input and feedback loops where we iterate. So this minimizes exposure um, and it gets really, really good outcomes. So that's what we would be proposing at the end. If it goes up to the file plus day, and um, I know along the way, there'll be lots of questions that we won't exactly know the answers to and, we'll, and some of it will be um, manual over automation in the beginning. Uh, but the intention is to, to start with something, start working with something, and we do it in a controlled way, and then we expand upon it when we make sure we're not exposed in any, in any, area, in, in area, any areas at all. So the ask for, for this call is anyone who would like to participate in having a look at the draft that we've got today, helping us work through some of the design issues, and we'll be doing that over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we, we may have a draft proposal in time for some of the governance calls in late May before that, before that day, so everyone has a chance to have a look at it. But uh, yeah, the ask now is just to set up number two. Any questions? No. Uh, um, so if you are, if you do have interest, please do um, Slack me. You can do it in the file plus the notaries channel actually, uh, and I'll set up some times where we can uh, sit down and review the work so far. Hey Meg, uh, David Kasem here from Tinfra. This is great. I'm really excited about potentially partnering with you on this. Awesome, awesome. Great to see you again, David. Um, Meg, I just want to add, I kicked off a, a thread after the morning conversation in the, the Phil Plus channel, the public one, um, where I uh, let people just ask people to wave at you uh, here. I'm putting a link in the chat as well if people want to follow that through. So there's a couple of people there that voice interest, and I think we're excited after the session in the morning. Um, second plug I'd like to make, uh, especially for those of you watching the recording, you probably already heard this, but those of you here that are live, um, this is also like a really cool opportunity for us to evolve like how this community works together too like this is a sort of like first stab at having like sub working groups within like the falcon plus community uh to operate in a little bit more like a like a down native format where we can create and spin up like work efforts around specific topics uh and so it's interesting also and compelling also purely from like a, how does our community evolve in doing research working together and making decisions together uh and so i'm pretty excited to see this happen uh, to see like subsets of our company self-elect into working into specific problem spaces that are hard, meaty, and will impact the program like program long term. Uh, so very grateful to Meg and uh, people that have generally supported her in ensuring that she, you know we're able to run this. And Meg is excited to sort of lead this effort. And then you know heavy encouragement to those of you that have an interest and inclination and are interested in this topic to work with her and work with each other uh, so that we can push along a very, very important uh, topic to scale up to support a huge set of customers through the Falcon Plus program.
I just saw um, Megan's comment. Yes, I'll, I will connect with Shrek as well. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Sweet. Thank, thank you. All right. The uh, two remaining, we uh, deep walked us through the abuse consequences, and we'll probably have about maybe four to five minutes left on the call after that for any uh, flags the community wants to raise. Deep, thanks. Yeah. So um, we've been getting a decent amount of reports in the last uh, three or four weeks, especially around the new election cycle on cases where there might be misuse or abuse of the Falcon Plus incentives. Uh, and that's been really awesome. So if you're watching this recording or you're here live and you contribute to that, like, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Some of that's happened in public. Some of that's happened uh, through Slack. Uh, some of that's happened on GitHub. Some of it's in private DMs and emails. And all of that is appreciated. Like every single person taking the time to do research and provide their insight on in what they think is happening in this ecosystem. Uh, super valued. Uh, while we're figuring out uh, how we want to proceed in some of these cases, uh, two sort of subcategories of problems are emerging. Uh, and I just wanted to do a quick pulse check with this community that's here right now live and, and get a sense for what people are thinking on, on how we should move towards reacting. So one is uh, there are cases in which like data cap itself once given to a client is not really used in a good or fair way. Uh, and that typically means storing disproportionately with like a single storage provider or a single storage providing organization resulting in like unfair distribution or uh, like profiteering effectively where like, you know, people make off. And it, it may be that it's self-dealing. It may be that like the notary owns those storage providers. It may be other things, but uh, there's, there's some loop here where like certain clients are making deals in a way that would be deemed unnatural. And that is visible on the blockchain. Uh, and so that's the first sort of category. The second category is a subset of that, like when the notary actually gets involved. Um, and then there's like make, like using data cap in a way that isn't really effective, like on chain. So a good example of this is making repeated deals of the same piece of data, um, like more than once with the same storage provider or like the same minor ID. So you, you as a client, like expending data cap unnecessarily to store additional replicas with the same storage providing institution. Uh, there's no real good reason to do that. It just expands data cap and results in like better rewards for that SP because they already have that car file and they can easily make those deals, but it doesn't accrue any value for the client or for the network. Um, and so given that we also had a FIP toss and implemented in the last release, which is now kind of out and a lot of people are using it, we do have the ability to roll back data cap from a client account. Uh, we have also had the ability to request the root key holders to like remove a notary and remove a notary's like data cap allocation. Uh, and so we have options for hammers. We just need to figure out how we want to use them uh, and, and how we sort of want to proceed. And so I'd love to get a sense for, you know, people that heard what I just said and like are aware of you know, places where this could be happening. Like, what do you think we should be looking into as frameworks for proposals on levying consequences in cases of abuse. Um, examples are like, do, you, do we ban clients? Do we ban GitHub accounts? Because GitHub accounts might have multiple addresses on chain or is it just addresses on chain and whoever they've sent money to? Or is it like a warning mechanism and then a banning mechanism? Or is it just, and if it is a banning mechanism, is it more like a suspension that's temporal or non-temporal? Uh, what do we do with notaries in the case of abuse? Like, do we want to actually remove people from being notaries? Uh, how do they earn the trust back? Uh, so these are the kinds of questions that I want us as a community to be thinking about with, with regards to reacting to some of this uh, work in the coming weeks. Uh, and so this is my, before it becomes a discussion on GitHub, it's a community discussion here. And so I'm prompting to say, hey, give me your thoughts while you're sitting here. Like, what are your reactions to what I just said? And let's use that to shape some of the conversation more productively in the coming weeks. I know many of you have opinions on this that you shared before. I'd love to hear them. I think, uh, Deep, it'd be helpful if you could use, give us an example, like what have you seen and, and like what's the scale of it? So we yeah. can see. So I think for the first type of common case, I'd say it's like we've seen cases where a storage provider ID is, multiple IDs are owned by like the same organization. Uh, and have similar traits and a client will go and store like all of their data 
with those storage providing IDs. And so like that's not actually distributing or getting data into different like locations or different storage providers. And it just ends up looking like you're making all your deals with one entity when you're claiming on your application that you will make it with multiple entities. Uh, second example is one that I mentioned earlier where like the same CID will occur like more than once between the same client ID and the same minor ID on chain. Uh, and that's really weird to have like repeated deals with the exact same piece between a client and an SP. Like, why would you do that? That makes zero sense. Um, and so that's another one. There's cases in which a notary will give a client data, and this is way, way smaller and much harder to prove, but notary gives data cap to a client, client makes a deal with a with the storage provider ID, and that storage providing ID has been claimed by the notary in the past. Uh, and like that's fine up to a certain number. What happens when it's like 30 or 40 percent uh, versus like 15 or 20 percent? And so uh, third case, I'm less worried about. It's very, very difficult to also prove it on chain, but the first two are pretty easy. Uh, and and it's like in the Tebby bytes. Uh, and so that's where, where I'm at right now. Um, I've also started asking questions about this and some GitHub issues. And so I'll start consolidating and reporting these things formally starting with the next governance call. Look, I think, yeah, I've seen you doing that. I think, you you know, that's the best place to start, right? Like this is what we're seeing can you explain it? And you've got like, you know, three days to come back and rectify it. And if you don't, like, um, I don't know, I suppose they're booted out because there, there aren't any consequences at the moment, really. And I, I don't know, can you rescind rewards? Is that? That's really tricky. So we can, we can remove data cap from a notary, yes. Removing data cap from a client that's unused, we can now because of the FIP that passed in version 15. In terms of removing it from a sector, that is very difficult. It is possible. It would require a FIP because that's a chain state change where you go back and remove the quality adjustment on the sector. Um, there have been FIPs that have been proposed that change the way in which like the compensation happens for a sector, which would make it easier to also strip a sector of like its quality adjustment. But for now, that would be like a very difficult change and, and could result in the chain forking and stuff. And so I think we we have to use that as a tool, but use it extremely sparingly in very, very extreme situations. We do have the fact that most deals right now are pretty temporary on our side as well, uh, where like we as a network rely on deal renewal more so than like forever deal making. My last question is, what are the stats around it? Like, what proportion are you talking about? Is it 1%, 5%, 10%? Because that helps put it in context. If you're talking about something that's there's always going to be, we're always going to face this. Yeah. But um, it's just how much is it a liability? How much, how much yeah. it, does it, you know, impact reputational perception? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't actually know because the order in which I'm doing this is not, what are all the sources? And so actually Alex's comments in the chat are pretty accurate, which is it's very, very difficult to track this at like across the board right now. We're still very much in like the tool building phase for it. Uh, many of you have heard, of, heard us mention uh, and we've made a lot of progress with tools. It's helped me a lot in the investigations that I'm doing right now. Uh, but it's not yet at the point where like we're like publicly able to figure out these stats and track them on like a global scale. It's more for this particular like whistleblow or for this like weird thing that somebody noticed that was happening uh, was it actually bad or not bad? Uh, and so there's like open, like there's likely to, out of this initial investigation, we're probably going to end up with like, like somewhere between four and six, like official disputes against entities or actors on the chain. Uh, so it's not massive uh, yet, um, but I think it's important for us to think about the precedents we'll set early, uh, like what we view as a risk and what we don't view as a risk and how heavy handed we want to be as a community to deter versus also to be forgiving and ensure that, you know, it's an early net, like it's early in the lifespan of the network. We want people to do the right thing. How do we encourage people to do the right thing kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you just have to know how you define it, what is abuse. And then I think it, it comes back to targets. If there's based on how much data cap is in the program, how much is acceptable as a tolerance yeah. for, for that. And then if we if we know what those things are, then then it can be managed. Cool. Yeah, so I think presenting some sort of consolidated report with some hypothesis would be helpful at that scale. So I'll work towards that as well. Fair enough. Any other thoughts? 
anyone particularly excited to work on this sort of stuff, hit me up anytime. <laughs> All right, Kerry, I'm going to throw it back over to you to open the floor up if there's anything else. Yeah, I appreciate the throw. I'll catch it and I'll throw it back out. We have about three minutes if anybody would like to talk about something we've already said or like an issue for discussion. You really do have dulcet tones, Kevin. Like it's almost calming listening to each other. Well, I have a project to present, but I'm not sure uh, if other people have anything to present. Otherwise, I can try next time. If you have a presentation, Let's put a pin in that so we give you your proper time. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Fill out in this uh, GitHub repository that we flagged. Say, hey, Kevin, I'd like to present. Um, the the one for the next next Tuesday, right? You got it. So if you're okay. on this one here, just leave me a comment. Kevin trying to present, and I'll make sure to put you on the list. Cool. Thanks.